I'm sure you agree with me that this has been one bizarre May. Uh, a couple weeks ago we had snow. Now we have uh, high 70s, we had 80s, we had you know all this weather going back and forth. We have, um, have not had public mass, unless you went to the deacon ordination today, uh, all of May. And uh, tomorrow um, we're going to be, for the first time, having public reception of Holy Communion, which we announced last week. Thankfully, the bishop has also said, uh, with uh, movement of the governor, that now we will also be having public masses again, starting as early as next weekend, but maybe the following weekend. Um, uh, and inserted in the bulletin, which you can pick up on the way out, or, and which we have on our parish website for those of you watching at home, is the uh, letter from the bishop, which you can read at your leisure. Uh, that being said, he's not yet given us norms for how we're supposed to proceed with that, which means that um, depending on how complicated those norms are and when we actually get them depends on whether we actually have mass next weekend. So if he comes to us with fr on Friday with these incredibly complicated norms, you can be sure we're not having mass next weekend. If it comes on Monday or Tuesday and they're fairly simple, then we'll make sure that we have mass uh, for next weekend. Uh, that's my hope, that's my plan, but I don't want to promise anything until I know more details. But the joy is that we do now have, uh, the bishop has said, no later than Corpus Christi weekend, so that's not this coming weekend, but the weekend after, no, we, no later than Corpus Christi weekend, we'll be starting with Mass again publicly. So praise the Lord with that. So today we celebrate uh, Pentecost, the Vigil of Pentecost. Tomorrow is Pentecost Sunday, and that's always a very special day for me, uh, not only because I have a great love for the Holy Spirit, but also because I was ordained on the day before Pentecost in 2003. That would have been June 7th. And then on June 8th, I had my first Mass, Pentecost Sunday. Uh, and it was truly a joy to be able to celebrate that as a, uh, a holy feast day. Of course, um, this year... Uh, It'll be a whole long 17 years. He was just 17, you know, um, uh, uh, of priesthood. So we praise the Lord for that. Um, and with this, we recognize, as I've been talking about the last few weeks, about the coming of the Holy Spirit is our call into the very heart of God. God the Father sent Jesus, his Son, into our humanity, to walk our walk, talk our talk, live our life, and die our death, so that we would know that God, Almighty God, has experienced every form of suffering, every struggle, every joy, humor, everything that we deal with, He has dealt with. Not looking on from the outside, or even as God with infinite divine knowledge, but with human frailty, human weakness, human experience. And when he died our death, he then rose from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit so that he would break the power of death. And now he gives us the Holy Spirit, that eternal bond between the Father and the Son. He pours out his Holy Spirit into our lives through the gifts of baptism, through confirmation, through holy orders, through all sorts of other ways, he pours out his gifts of the Holy Spirit in our lives so that we can now be united into that very gift of, the holy, uh, of God's love for us. God's love is now no longer out there. God is not watching us from a distance, but he has poured his Spirit into our lives so that he is closer to us than we are to ourselves. In the first reading, we hear about how that Holy Spirit was poured on those disciples in that upper room that said early, earlier in the Acts that there were about 120 people gathered in that upper room. And they were gathered there, and they were praying, and Mary was with them. And it says here they were filled with the Holy Spirit, that there was a strong driving wind. Couldn't we use a wind right now? Strong driving wind. 
and uh, tongues as a fire came and rested on each one of them. And they were then given these, uh, these, the, the, the strength, the courage to go out and to proclaim the good news. Not only the strength and the courage, but then the ability, because here they go out, and now there are people, as we heard, uh, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, inhabitants from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, and Egypt, and the districts of Lib- Libya and Cyrene. Uh, travelers from Rome, both Jews and Ju- converts to Ju- Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. And they all heard them speaking in their own language. Even though they were Galileans, speaking just from the depths of their heart. The Holy Spirit came and touched the ears of every person that was there so that they could understand the good news. And it says, I I think it says that about 3,000 were converted and baptized that day. Amazing. And it says, roughly translated into English, Um, it's about uh, 600 words, which means for every word that Peter spoke in his homily there, about five people were converted. Sometimes we have 3,000 words spoken by a priest and no one is converted. But that's why we have the Holy Spirit. We ask the Holy Spirit to come and to transform. And so the Holy Spirit... The church teaches us that the Holy Spirit comes and he gives each one of us gifts for holiness. We hear about them in the book of the prophet Isaiah. Gifts of wisdom and understanding. Gifts of knowledge and discernment. Counsel. Gifts of fortitude or or strength. Piety. Fear of the Lord. He gives us these gifts. He stirs them up. He, He fills us with these things for our sake of growing in holiness so that we can grow closer to Almighty God. These gifts of knowledge which are, for instance, not a knowledge about God, but an intimate knowing of God. A knowing of God the way a husband and wife know each other. I remember hearing uh, one person who had been married for about 30 years saying that he could be sitting on the couch and squeeze his wife's hand and she would know exactly what he was saying as he says, go get me a drink. And she would squeeze his hand back and said, get your own drink. that this knowing, deep and intimate knowing of the other. And God gives us his Holy Spirit so that we can know him. So that God isn't something out there. But God is here, real. Someone we know. What a friend we have in Jesus. That he is a friend of ours. Someone that we share our lives with. Intimate knowing. And that's each of those gifts of the Holy Spirit that we hear about in Isaiah. That we talk about poured out in, the, in confirmation. Those gifts that are given to us so that we can grow closer to God in holiness. And then uh, St. Paul, we kind of skipped over. It was like stuck in the middle of the two parts of the second reading that they kind of skipped over. But St. Paul, in his first letter to the Corinthians, he talks about these other gifts. And that he doesn't say these are the only gifts that there are. In fact, they're they're innumerable. But these are what we usually call as charisms, which charism literally means gift. These are gifts for the building up of the church. Where... The Isaiah gifts are for us to grow in holiness. These other gifts are given to us so that we can build up the church, help others to grow in holiness. And St. Paul says, To one, the Spirit gives wisdom and discourse. To another, the power to express knowledge. Through the Spirit, one receives faith. 
By the same Spirit, another is given gifts of healing, and still another miraculous powers. Prophecy is given to one and to another power to distinguish one spirit from another. To receive the gift of one receives the gifts of tongues, and another that of interpretation of tongues. But it is one and the same Spirit who produces all these gifts and distributes them to each as he wills. And as I said, that's not an exhaustive list. He speaks about other gifts in another part of Corinthians. St. Peter speaks of other gifts. These are gifts which are given to the church so that some have some, others have others, and they're for the building up of the church so that just because someone might have the gift of healing, for instance, doesn't mean they're holy, but rather that gift is used so that other people can come to know the power and love and incredible uh, gift that God wants to give to us. And sometimes that's seen in hospitality, sometimes that's seen in music, sometimes that's seen in wisdom. You, you, you may recognize that Isaiah also talked about wisdom, where that, that wisdom is there for us to grow in holiness. There's also wisdom which is spoken to help others to be able to grow in holiness. And each of us has been given different gifts, and it's a matter of saying, okay, what gifts is God moving in my life so that I can help others to come to know God? So that I can draw others deeper into the mystery of God? Because we are one body. And while one person has one gift, another has another, and we need everyone so that all the gifts can be used to draw us closer to Jesus. And as we come to know the Holy Spirit, as we come to move in the Holy Spirit, this fruit of the Spirit comes, and we see it moving in our lives. It becomes not only just to blossom, but then to grow and to become ripe. The fruit of the Spirit, St. Paul says in the letter to the Galatians, is love, joy, peace, patient endurance, kindness, generosity, faith, mildness, and chastity. These gifts, these fruit, rather, of the Spirit that come forth, that as we grow closer to Almighty God, as we grow in holiness, we start to see I'm growing in love. I'm growing in joy, in peace. And it's a good barometer to say, how am I doing? Okay, I need to grow because I don't have much peace right now. Okay, come Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit. And so as we, we celebrate the Feast of Pentecost, let us beg the Lord, to pour forth his spirit upon us, to transform us, to draw us ever closer to his heart, that we may say yes to those gifts that he gives to us, gifts for our own growth and holiness, gifts for the building up of the church, so that as we grow closer to God, those fruit may come and may be strengthened in us and may come to full maturity so that we may truly be Christians, followers of Christ, people who are Jesus to the people of the world.